Hello and welcome to Market Guru. Thanks for joining in. I'm Surabhi Upadhyay Matthew, standing in for Vivek Law. Joining us on the show today is Peter Elson of Aberdeen Asset Management Asia. But before we kickstart our conversation with Peter, let's take a look at how the markets are doing. Well, we began the, the markets on a rather strong note when we actually saw the markets move up as much as 1%, but that has actually cooled off for now, even as we see the Sensex as well as Nifty now up nearly just about one-tenth of a percent for now. And, uh, you know, we've just seen the Nifty is back below the 5,900 mark. So keep an eye on those markets. In terms of the dollar rupee, as we all already know that we are at an all-time low right now, uh, the dollar against the rupee is trending by as much as 1%, currently standing at 57.70. Keep an eye out on that because that will be a crucial uh, data point to uh, look at. And in terms of sectors to watch, uh, back uh, on the rupee, we have the BSE IT move up as much as 1%, uh, up at around 62.09. And BSE Healthcare, on the other hand, showing a little bit of weakness right now, uh, down by uh, nearly 1%. Of course, in terms of, uh, you know, the technology stocks, which will tend to gain on the back of that strengthening dollar, we have TCS move by around 1.5%, Infosys, as well as HCL Technologies moving up by as much as 1%. But on the other hand, we also have a few movers as far as our own Nifty goes. Kane India and M&M are the other two counters which are showing a little bit of strength today. Sun Pharma, on the other hand, taking a hit of nearly 2% below the market thousand for now. So overall, it does seem like a good day for the, for the dollar against the rupee as well as the IT star space. Uh, keep an eye out on these even as we go into this, uh, this session. Thanks for that. Let's say hi to Peter Elson of Aberdeen Asset Management. As we speak to Peter, there is a currency crisis, a currency carnage of sorts that's playing out, and the Indian rupee has been badgered as well. Peter, it's great to have you on the show today. Before I even talk about equities, let's just look at what's happened to a couple of these emerging market currencies, including the Indian rupee and what we're seeing on the screens. These are historic lows for the rupee. Mm -hmm. what, what's your sense of what's happening out there? Yeah, well, as you say, this isn't just the, the Indian rupee. It's a number of uh, uh, emerging market currencies that are, that are selling off quite dramatically. Uh, I suppose this is all part of uh, increasing fears that once these sort of major developed market central banks uh, start to tighten, that's going to uh, result in some fairly significant outflows from uh, from emerging markets, and uh, the uh, the Indian uh, rupee is is uh, one of the victims of that, having uh, it, it being a market which has seen uh, you know some fairly large inflows over the last two or three years. Peter, you said it. So there's a lot of speculation about the possibility of outflows. But those outflows haven't really started yet, neither from the Indian bond market nor the Indian equity market. Do you see this as a real distinct possibility? Is this a real threat? Well, that's... Uh, hmm. Yes, I mean, that's not really uh, our understanding. We, we've already seen some, some fairly hefty uh, outflows from, uh, from emerging market uh, equity funds from emerging market uh, bond funds so uh, certainly you know they, we could see a lot more but I think uh, we have already started to see some some big outflows. What's the stance then in that case I know that in your conversation with Bloomberg uh, earlier in May you were looking at the possibility of this whole trade which is really based on liquidity petering off because it's not really based on corporate earnings What's the assessment now as we're looking at the middle of June? Uh, well, I'm not sure I heard the question correctly, but if, if I heard it right, that you were asking me about the gold price. Um, I suppose what we see with respect to gold is something that looks a little bit similar to, uh, to what we saw in the second quarter of 2000 and eight when uh, the gold price was selling off quite sharply uh, and arguably it was uh, sort of an early warning signal of uh, deflationary pressures that were plaguing the, uh, the global economy and, and deflationary pressures that uh, only later showed up in, uh, in equity markets. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we're going to see some sort of repeat 
of, uh, of 2008. But I do think that um, uh, the, the, the risks with respect to, uh, to the global e- economy are with respect to uh, deflationary pressures rather than inflationary pressures. I think the U.S. is probably going to be a lot weaker than people think this year. And I think the other uh, large global economy, China, is also going to be uh, weaker than, than people expect. So uh, that is, can only mean one thing, which is that you know the global economy is going to be weaker than, than people think. And although eventually that will mean we get more stimulus, in, in the near term it probably means that there is potentially a little bit more weakness in, uh, in the gold price. Not only the gold price, of course, but uh, uh, other, other commodities as well. Peter, let's just go back to this whole question of flows and whether the QE tap will continue or not. What is the sense? We've seen that spike in bond deals in the U.S. Data out of the U.S. has been fairly robust. Uh, What's your sense from here on? Will liquidity inflows really start to dry up now in a market like India and perhaps elsewhere in Asia? Well, I, you know, I think uh, the Federal Reserve as well as uh, central banks elsewhere are in a very difficult position. I think they would, they would dearly love to be able to, to start thinking about withdrawing from these uh, extremely uh, loose policies that they've been running for some time. The only problem is that, uh, that they're not seeing the... Uh, the, the, the response to their policy that they would like. In other words, they're not seeing strong economic growth. So, uh, you know, we're, we're at a, a situation where they're starting, I think the central banks are starting to, to think that, unlike previously, where the, uh, you know, the, the, the near term uh, costs uh, certainly were outweighed by the, the benefits. I think they're now starting to, to question whether the, uh, the, the, the costs of continuing with these policies are actually starting to outweigh the, the benefits. And if that means uh, withdrawing from these uh, policies, even when economies are not that strong, then, then so be it. They'll do that. They'll wait to see what happens if we do then see a, a sharp downturn in, uh, in growth, they may well then uh, come back with, with more stimulus. But I think in the near term, we're probably going to see uh, a, a little bit of uh, withdrawal uh, from, uh, from their easy money policies, uh, just because they're starting to, to question the, uh, whether, the, basically they're doing a cost-benefit analysis and starting to wonder whether the the costs are now starting to outweigh the benefits. So, Peter, in case, as you're saying, in the near term, if that punch ball will, uh, will be taken away, what kind of, uh, you know, reverberations would be felt in financial markets? Are you looking at equities and heading lower, or will it continue to be limited pretty much to bonds and currencies? Um, I suspect that you're already starting to see it in equity markets as well. So it's really been across the board. In fact, you know, it's interesting to see last week that every single asset class was down last week, whether it was government bonds, equities, corporate bonds, commodities, everything was falling. And and that just tells you that, uh, you know, markets are, are concerned that, uh, as you say, the, the, the punch bowl is, is going to be uh, taken uh, away. So, yeah, I think everything is going to be uh, affected. Um, I suspect that will continue to be the case over the next uh, one or two months. As I said, if, if, things, if things turn really nasty, then, uh, then I think central banks will be forced to, uh, to reconsider. But in the meantime... I think they're desperate to, to try to, to st- at least start thinking about uh, uh, withdrawing their, uh, their easy money policies. So, Peter, in that case, if we are looking at a bit of a rough ride in the weeks to come, 
How are you gearing up for that and what place do Indian equities or Indian government bonds uh, find, if at all, in the portfolio right now? Well, in our, uh, in our Asia-Pacific multi-asset fund, uh, where we have, a, a, I suppose, what you'd call a neutral position in equities of about 40%, we're at around 35% at the moment, uh, which is, a, I suppose you would call that a, a moderate uh, underweight uh, position. Uh, and, you know, I think we're, we're going to be happy to continue to, to run that position for the next uh, two or three months uh, on the expectation that we are going to see some weakness in, uh, in equity markets. Um, but we're certainly, you know, not expecting a prolonged bear market. We, uh, we, we do see quite a lot of value in, in equity markets uh, and so would be uh, looking to uh, increase that uh, equity weighting uh, as, as and when uh, weakness actually materializes. What's the call on India now, Peter? There's a lot that's been going on, the government trying to prop up confidence, but then the overall weakness of our macroeconomic numbers, the current account, the fiscal deficit, etc. What's your call on the country, the economy and the market here? Yeah, well, we've, um, we've always sort of been aware that uh, from a macro perspective, not so much uh, the, the economics, but the politics uh, in India are, are pretty messy. Um, certainly on the, on the economics front, um, you know, there are issues with respect to uh, inflation, uh, current account deficit, budget deficit. But to be fair, you know, that's what you would expect of, of an emerging market that is at the stage of development that India is at. Uh, you know, India should be running uh, deficits uh, because it's in, a, it's in a, a, a very early stage of its, of its growth trajectory. Um, that said, you know, we've always managed to find companies that uh, always sort of tell us that, that they, uh, they prosper, they succeed in spite of the government rather than because of it. They seem to be able to uh, sort of gain market share to, to grow whether or not the economy is, is firing on all cylinders or not. So, uh, you know, yes, there are challenges with respect to what's happening in the economy, but that's really not what we look at at Aberdeen. I think uh, we've always felt that, um, you know, India is a great place for stock picking, uh, that, you know, you can find really good companies with, uh, on reasonable valuations, and uh, you know, we're happy to hold those regardless of what's going on in the economy. So are you looking for any interesting themes right now in this chop and churn, or are you completely staying away from Indian equities? No, I mean, within our equity portfolio, uh, we have a, a substantial overweight to India. That's been the case for a number of years. Um, as you and your viewers may know, we are very long-term investors. You, you won't see our, our weightings in, uh, in a particular uh, country or, or the, the companies themselves, for that matter, uh, change very much from uh, from month to month or from from year to year. Um, so we're certainly very comfortable with with that position, uh, and and see no reason why we would want to uh, to change that at the moment. Any preferred uh, sectors where you see more promise? And within India, uh, you know, it's been the story about consumption more or less, or about defensives like healthcare. Do you see that changing? Would you at all have preference for cyclical sectors and stocks in India now, Peter? Um, well, we, you know, as I, I think uh, the, the point I just made about being long-term investors, uh, it, it, 
also uh, applies to sectors as well. You know, our positions in sectors today are the, pretty much the same as they were three, four, five years ago. Um, the ones that we tend to like are, are the banks, not, not all the banks. We sort of avoid the state-owned banks, uh, but we like the, the banks in India. Uh, we like uh, healthcare, as you uh, mentioned. We like the consumer plays. Uh, infrastructure we try to uh, to get exposure to through through the cement companies um, you know there's always this question in India about the valuation of consumer stocks uh, when you're talking about multiples of 25 35 45 times for some of these uh, consumer plays is is that too pricey and you know perhaps it might those sorts of valuations might sort of limit upside in the in the sort of near term as in the next sort of year or so i think you have to put those valuations in the context of the the growth potential that india has you know india's gdp per capita is still very low there's still enormous potential for uh, for india's economy to to expand uh, and arguably some of these uh, consumer companies, their, their fair valuation perhaps should be closer to 60, 70, 80 times. Who knows? Uh, it depends, you know, how far ahead you want to look. If, you're, if you want to look 10, 15 years ahead, then certainly something closer to a, a three-figure valuation might be uh, more appropriate. Well, 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 a three-figure price-to-earnings multiple. All right, final question. Very quick one here, Peter. Again, coming back to the currency. Uh, for a foreign investor right now, sitting on an India portfolio, you're net-net neutral thanks to the rupees depreciation. I know Aberdeen is a long-term investor, but if structurally we're looking at this weakness lasting, uh, then is that going to be a concern, or would you stick on with investments in India anyway? Well, I don't think we, uh, I mean, we would disagree with the uh, with the notion that we are going to see uh, this sort of structural weakness continue. Uh, you know, we we think that uh, India remains a very compelling place to invest on a on a long term basis, uh, and that um, you know this this weakness in in the currency only makes it a that much more of a, uh, an interesting place to invest. So uh, I, I don't think uh, we do expect this, this weakness to, uh, to continue. Well, that's an optimistic note to end on. Peter, thanks so much for taking out the time today.